Welcome to the Pasadena Museum of History. The museum is proud to present the second podcast companion to accompany the reopening of its exhibit, Starting Anew, Transforming Pasadena, 1890 to 1930, an exhibit that explores the beginnings of Pasadena and its people. I'm your guest host, James DePietro. While indigenous people have inhabited the Arroyo Seco and the surrounding area for thousands of years, the city of Pasadena didn't take shape until the mid-19th century. Following its incorporation on June 19, 1886, as one of the first incorporated cities in what is now Los Angeles County, Pasadena embarked on a population explosion, fueled by residents and migrants from across the world that settled here for greater opportunities amongst the fields and orchards. Once again, we welcome the exhibit's curator, Brad McNeil, to continue our discussion of the newly expanded exhibit, Starting Anew. Brad, thank you for joining me and for the opportunity to talk with you about the exhibit. James, it's a pleasure to be with you and I'm very excited to to share information about the exhibit, Starting Anew. The museum is generously hosting us today and we are fortunate to actually be talking in one of the two main rooms of the exhibit. So it's a real honor to be here with you and surrounded by so much of Pasadena's history. The exhibit originally opened in 2020 before having to close due to COVID. Now reopened, the exhibit has been expanded. But before we talk about the new additions, I wanna dive into its mission. The years 1890 to 1930 were critically important to Pasadena's history as it saw tremendous growth and change. When putting together the exhibit, what story of Pasadena emerged that you wanted visitors to experience? You're right. In that period of time, those four decades, 1890 to 1930, were just an amazing time of growth for the community. When I started looking at the statistics about the population growth and the rate of growth, I was just amazed. It never had that rate of growth again after 1930, after the Depression hit. And a lot of the characteristics that people identify with Pasadena, the the iconic characteristics, really were created during that time. So when you look at Pasadena as a cultural center, as a center for art, as a center for science. You look at its architecture, a lot of it was developed during that time. And what I was amazed at, why did these people come? And how did they come together and work together to create this growth? So that, those were sort of some driving uh, questions that I had. You have selected some incredible photographs and pieces to weave a dynamic narrative. Did these items set the stage for the exhibit, or did you have an original concept and then select the pieces and photographs to support it? I have been working at the museum for about 20 years and surrounded by things from our archives and our collections. So I I knew about a lot of the images and artifacts that would relate to this period of time. I knew that we had them and that uh, this was really helped in, in creating the exhibit, that we didn't have to go out and find them somewhere else. So I really depended upon our archives and collection for a lot of my re- research. And it was how you organize what you pull to tell your story. And I really had the story in my head And then it was just doing the exploration in our archives and collections to find things that will help tell the story. And those could be ephemera. They could be images. We have over a million images in our our collection. And they can be different types of artifacts. So I had the story in my head somewhat. But then I was able to find so many wonderful things in the museum's archives. In your curator's statement, you remarked that the citizens of Pasadena had a vision. What do you think these people wanted Pasadena to be? And did this vision change over the course of these four decades? Well, I think that very possibly the vision did change. People were attracted to Pasadena originally because of its sort of natural beauty. And and again, this exhibit looks at the community developing from a small agricultural community 
into a bustling young city. So the first people that came here were really interested in agriculture. I mean, the, the citrus and orange industry. The early days of Pasadena were you had the Indiana colony who came out, people from the Midwest who um, were coming to California to get away from the cold winters of back east and they were attracted by the climate and the beauty and then that they could actually do agriculture and make a nice living. So that, but that changed, and this exhibit really looks at why people came here to come to a winter resort. So there, there were things that attracted people here. It was the beauty of the area. It was the, the climate and the health, people looking for a healthy climate. When I say it was start, starting anew, the name of the exhibit, it was a lot of people came here, and they really did start anew. They might have had health problems in, in uh, back east, but they came out here and hoping to heal themselves. Um, or they came out here to visit a winter resort and then fell in love with the place and stayed. The vision changed, but there were, there were visionary people this is that, that really wanted to make Pasadena a very unique community. Uh, they, they looked at other cities around the world and they were influenced by what they liked in those cities and they wanted to duplicate or even improve on that for the, for the city of Pasadena. One staggering chart that you have on display shows the incredible growth of Pasadena during this 40-year period where it went from under 5,000 people to over 75,000 people, a rate that far outpaced the growth of the state of California. So who were they? As we know, that included a mix of members of the elite class and laborers, but also ethnic minorities from Asia and Eastern Europe, and a large migration of African American families coming from the South. Well, that is one of the main questions that we ask in the exhibit, and it was a diverse group of people that that came here for somewhat different reasons. So we had the people that came, and they became part of the agricultural community, and they wanted to build a wonderful town. Um, and raise their families here and so on. But a big change was the railroad coming in in the 1880s, and it made it much easier for people to get here. And there, when I talk about visionary people, there were someone like Walter Raymond, who started one of the first, the first big resort hotel in Pasadena. Now, he came from back east where his family had a business uh, uh, working with hotels and doing tours of beautiful places. And he came out to Pasadena, fell in love with it, and had the vision to create a grand hotel here. And that took off, and other entrepreneurs followed him. So um, Pasadena started to develop this great reputation as a, a winter resort. Now the city jumped on this and uh, marketed the, uh, the community. So you had the Board of Trade for Pasadena and they would create pamphlets and do all sorts of marketing that would attract people here. You had the railroads who did the same thing. They're, they're um, advertising the city. The hotels, you have things like the Tournament of Roses, which we're still famous for in Pasadena today, but that started during this time and that was to celebrate uh, the city and let other people know. So what happened as the city started to grow, there was more and more opportunity. Wealthy people were coming here for the, uh, to stay in the resort hotels and so on, but th they needed the support. They needed the services and goods to support the growing city. So there was opportunity for all sorts of people from different walks of life. And early Pasadena did have a diverse community. There were the wealthy, but the vast majority of people that came to Pasadena and stayed were not the super wealthy. Um, they were uh, middle class and sometimes people with very meager means who came here, but they found opportunity so that they could raise their families and find success. This exhibit is a reflection of our community. Most items are from the vast archives of the museum, but there are also quite a few that are on loan from other places. What are some of the more unique items that are on display? There are so many themes that we cover in this exhibit. It is a broad overview 
of this history. Going back to the word ephemera, so those are items that people use every day. You don't think they have a lot of value, but down the line they might have real historical value. So I love a lot of the objects that we have, for example, things from the resort hotels. Of, of, uh, it could be the plates they use for um, the menus they use at their restaurant, things like that. Throughout the exhibit, we try to show the changing fashion and technology during those four decades. So as you walk through the exhibit, you're going to see different clothing, uh, different types of technology. It could be typewriters, it could be telephones, a whole variety of different things. Bicycles are one. Just think, 1890 to 1930, how our world was changing with all these new inventions. Pasadena embraced new inventions as it, it became a very wealthy community and people embraced those new inventions. So we try to show that in the exhibit. So uh, that along with um, our images, I think people will really enjoy. With the closure of the museum due to COVID, you were able to reflect on the previous worldwide health emergency, the 1918 influenza pandemic. According to figures shared in the exhibit, the 1918 flu claimed the lives of about 6% of the U.S. population. As perspective is so critical in history, COVID has claimed the lives of less than 0.3% of Pasadena's population. How did Pasadena respond to the 1918 pandemic and what impact did it have on the city? You have to remember that when this, the um, 1918 influenza hit, we were in the getting into World War I. And um, what fascinated me about comparing the influenza and then living through COVID today was all of the, the many similarities. Each community had its own uh, government and you had guidelines that were set by the health department, uh, the federal health department. But in Pasadena, people pretty much came together. Now we were at war, so it was basically, if you weren't taking care of yourself and you weren't trying to combat the spread of the influenza, you were somewhat hurting the war effort. Because we were at war, the president, President Wilson, didn't talk much, much about the influenza. It was running rampant. I mean, many people know now it, it was called the Spanish flu, but it actually originated there's good, good proof that it originated in Kansas. Uh, it, it, it didn't start in, in Spain, that's, that's for sure. But Pasadena had a progressive mayor at the time and a progressive health department. They did, they stopped people from gathering in large groups. They stopped, c controlled people in transportation, in public transportation. They, at certain times, they did put uh, mask mandates on. Uh, they isolated people. They were very uh, well organized in fighting the spread of influenza. And they did remarkably well compared to other communities that might not have been as progressive. They worked together. Again, this is the um, people came to, to, together. A lot of the social organizations got involved. The Red Cross was, was very involved, and, and over this period of time, the Red Cross really grew as an organization. So the city of Pasadena realized how dangerous the influenza was and responded accordingly. There was pushback uh, by some of the residents for regulations that were put on the city and many similarities to what's happening today. The, the city enforced public gathering in large places. They canceled parades. They closed at certain times schools. They closed churches. They closed movie theaters. And there was some pushback as there is today. But the vast majority of citizens really came together and tried to be responsible in their actions. The city did divide up the community, the health department, into different sections, and um, all of the doctors in the area were um, required to notify the city health department if they had patients with the influenza. If uh, people were sick, they were, they were quarantined in their house, and their family was quarantined in their house for a period of time. 
So again, there was a war going on, and the war effort was very important to the citizens of Pasadena. And if there was a feeling that if you weren't being protective, trying to stop the spread of this influenza, you were hurting the war effort. You were, quote unquote, a slacker. And that um, wasn't looked upon well. So the city did relatively well with the influenza, um, as I think the city is doing relatively well uh, today with, with COVID. Another interesting new addition to the exhibit is a section that focuses on World War I. To help tell the story of the war here in Pasadena, you highlight the lives of three people, Walter M. Bodway, May Henderson Wells, and Lyle Richard Barnett. Can you share what visitors were learned about these three individuals? Yes, this was wonderful to find um, in our collections and to explore the stories of these three individuals. I call them the aviator, the nurse, and the ambulance driver. And all, they all came from um, different walks of life, uh, but all were involved in, in the war effort. And we were fortunate to have the uniforms of all of these three individuals. So we have a, the aviator uniform of Mr. Bodeway. We, we have a, a, the beautiful nurse's uniform of Mrs. Henderson. And then we have the ambulance uniform of Mr. Barnett. They were all somewhat volunteers, and they fortunately all survived the war. They were all in Europe. They were all near the battlefields. Pasadena rallied around the war effort. Again, did a lot of humanitarian work even before the United States got in the war. Citizens of Pasadena were contributing through the Red Cross and other organizations trying to take care of all of the people that were displaced in Europe and offer uh, medical support for, for people in the war. So they raised a great deal of money. One of the stories that we tell is, is about the ambulance corps, which was fascinating to me. I, I had a great uncle who was an ambulance driver in, in France, but to learn how the ambulance corps was developed in Pasadena was very enlightening. And even before we got in the war, the Red Cross was organizing ambulance and getting ambulance, training ambulance drivers and, of course, nurses to go to Europe. And a lot of uh, individuals in Pasadena would contribute money to totally build an outfit, an ambulance, and they, they would um, make that as a donation to the war effort. So once we were in the war, the U.S. Army wanted to coordinate all of the ambulance corps in the United States because there were many different organizations that were contributing in ambulances. So they took control of that and they created a number of ambulance companies across the United States. And Pasadena and our ambulance driver that we feature in this exhibit was in ambulance company number one. Uh, so. Pasadena jumped on th this effort very, very quickly. The Pasadena Museum of History resides on the historic estate of Eva and Dr. Phineas, and they play an important role in telling the story of Pasadena during this period. Eva was a businesswoman, philanthropist, and an accomplished painter. In fact, her home became a salon and meeting place for the emerging art colony here in Pasadena. Since art was such an important part of Eva's life, can you talk about the paintings that are on display in the exhibit? Well, Pasadena became a center for artists uh, in Southern California. There were a, a number of, of centers where artists came, um, and they actually created almost like a little colony of artists. And you have Laguna Beach is famous, Santa Barbara, uh, San Diego. But Pasadena was a major center, and partly due to the beauty of the area, the resort hotels. So it attracted a number of wonderful artists uh, in the early 1900s that are uh, t today pretty much known as plain air artists. They did beautiful landscapes of the area. And they had a built-in customer with the people that came to visit because they might want to take home a nice souvenir of how beautiful this area was. Plus, the, the people that lived in the community started collecting their, their art. 
So Eva, who came in 1896 um, and had been studying art all of her life, um, and she was born in 1849, so she was you know, in mid middle age when she came here, was a prolific artist. And what we have put in the exhibit is a selection of Eva's paintings from 1896 to 1927, all paintings that she did, watercolors actually, of um, California. And this is on a, a video screen in the exhibit. And you can, by looking at these images, you, you can see how beautiful California was and how much it's changed. It's still beautiful, but when you see her paintings of places like Santa Monica Beach, Coronado Island, Catalina Island, Lake Tahoe, uh, you'll be just amazed at, at how beautiful it was, plus just her, her local paintings of Pasadena and surrounding areas. So that's a, this is a, I think people will be excited to see this new edition. All exhibits are reflections of their curators. You have a long family history here in Pasadena, and some of your family's history intersects with some of the stories you tell here. Why was this exhibit so personal for you? Well, I've been interested in history from um, an early age and maybe due to my family being in California for a long time. And a lot of history came from family members, um, especially my, my grandmother when I was very young. And then I was very fortunate to have some great history teachers. But uh, my family, one side of it through my father goes back to 1781. And um, it was basically, it's a Spanish side of my family, uh, the, the Arguello family. And Jose Dario Arguello came to California somewhat starting anew in 1781 and, and led settlers into the, the new Pueblo of Los Angeles. And I have many generations that lived in California. I, I have a, a sea captain who came in 1850 and married into the old Spanish family. And his, his history was very interesting in uh, San Diego, San Francisco, and, and Los Angeles. So I've always loved history, and, and co coming to work at the museum, it, it was a later job for me. I used to be in, in retail, uh, work for the, the Broadway department stores for many years, but this was really like being in a candy store. I was just surrounded by history. I guess it is somewhat some, from my my early background that I appreciated it so much. And then the other thing about working at the museum is all of the people that you meet. The best part of my job over the last 20 years was I'm always learning something new because with each new exhibit, there's a whole new learning curve and always meeting new people. And, um, and, sh and they share their knowledge about history. And it's been a wonderful job uh, to have had. When visitors journey through the exhibit and exit onto the beautiful grounds of the Fenness Estate, what message or imprint do you want them to take away from the exhibit? I hope it enhances their appreciation of Pasadena and Pasadena history and what a unique community we are. And also what people can do when they come together with a vision what they can accomplish in, to improve things. So basically, I'd be happy if, if that happened. Finally, how can people support the museum and its mission to preserve Pasadena's history? Come to the museum, come and visit, become a member, um, get involved. One of the aspects that I really like about the museum is that it's so open to the general public. I invite people to come and explore our archives. If they're doing, if they want to do any sort of research on their own family history or any local history, this is a great place to start. But the museum is a nonprofit. Um, it basically survives due to its membership and support from the community. So I just invite everybody to come. Brad. Thank you for being so generous with your time and for all your hard work curating this wonderful exhibit. Thank you, James. It was a pleasure. Thank you for joining this companion discussion about our exhibit starting anew. 
transforming Pasadena 1890 to 1930. The museum would like to thank our exhibit sponsors, the Palahemo Trust and Susan Stevens and family. Since 1970, the museum has been headquartered on the beautiful Finnis Estate, a Pasadena cultural landmark that is also listed on the National Register of Historic Places. We welcome all visitors to the museum and to explore the estate, our exhibits, store, and archives. To learn more about the Pasadena Museum of History, go to PasadenaHistory.org, where you will find information on current exhibits, programs, events, and more. And please visit and subscribe to our YouTube channel for current and featured content and podcasts. Thank you for joining us and for supporting the Pasadena Museum of History.